Okay, well, uh, welcome to this webinar uh, titled Attack of the Clones. Um, that, I hope, was a, a, a neat hook to get you into uh, to listening to this because, of course, I nicked it from Star Wars and also um, it kind of says what I'm about to say, I guess, in many ways. I'm uh, Dr. Jonathan Merritt and I, I work at De Montfort University in um, Leicester, UK. Um, for about six years or so, I've been concentrating on sports law and in particular sports that involve horses not least because I ride myself I, I'm, I'm a competitor at a very low and inglorious level uh, with British dressage but um, I do my best and that keeps me in touch with what's going on on the ground level to a certain extent as well as my research I've moved on to the slide now which gives you a few details about myself um, and a somewhat cheery picture which I hope you can Put up with at this at this time of the day um and then um, i i do run a research blog as well which I, I guess would be an easier way to access some of the material without having to plow through one of my longer journal articles but um particularly i want to talk to you today about the uh, issues that the fei and the british horse racing authority as the main players in the equine sport world uh, face in terms of integrity now so that I can make the point that if clones are here and here to stay which I believe they are um, then um, we do have additional ch challenges that haven't really been properly thought through um, but in doing that I've got to do what I always do uh, in these um, conversations is, is try and try and make the case for the fact that the equestrian the equine is in fact uh, an athlete although a non-human one and um, I first noticed this in uh, some uh, literature that the FEI actually produces and they talk about the athlete being the horse athlete being the one that, that can't speak for itself and that's that's how they they justify the the severity I guess of the um, the, the um, prohibited medication rules and so on because they're they're speaking for the athlete that's not autonomous so I, I wanted to do a little a little um, discussion about how, how to what extent that's that's a real concept or whether it's just a term of art so um if i just uh, point out that if you want more information then there are a number of publications that you could read that are more more detailed and I, i'm bound to do this aren't i i'm going to plug my book which is coming out uh, in december if you go onto the link um about halfway down that slide that that will take you to the the amazon uh, link for that and it is um, it is quite a significant sum for the hardback but um, if you if you want a more economical version there's the ebook which I think is coming out quite soon but I don't know library budget might stand it um, and um, I'm very pleased to be able to put some of these ideas out there in in published form it's actually based on my PhD thesis so if you want to to look at the same issues um, written slightly differently then you could always just uh, seek out my PhD thesis from the link at the bottom of the slide and um, that one is is actually free um, so are the articles okay so let me start by saying that um, the what the status quo is at the moment with um, horse sport and regulation and I'm trying not to be too legalistic because I, I, I want to reach a larger audience than just lawyers um, but if, if I could just point out that that with the the uh, FEI, the Feder Federation Equestre Internationale, who 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 run um, the Olympic sports and the many others as well, um, that that's their little fiefdom. Um, and in fact, the, the horse racing is run completely differently. And in Britain, that's that's regulated by the British Horse Racing Authority. And every jurisdiction that's got horse racing in it has its own. And Australia will have its own. America will have its own, and so on. The BHA is possibly the oldest and, and has the, the most august history. Um, it was, in fact, the first sport of any that had any doping controls, which is because um, American trainers were turning up in Britain in 1900 with horses that were um, high on cocaine, basically. And of course, they, they won races, um, didn't do them any good, but it, they won races and, and the doping control started there before any human sports at all. But what I, I want to point out is that the, um, the two regimes are completely different in the way they're written but they both rely on something called strict liability and and that is where um, the human uh, in a human sport is autonomous and responsible for everything that goes into their bodies so that if there is something there that shouldn't be there there is no question of 
uh, uh, thinking about did they mean to do it or not. It's rather like, um, I think in most jurisdictions, if you go through a red traffic light or speed, there's no point arguing with the police officer that you didn't mean to, uh, you did, and that's it. Um, and that's quite different to uh, criminal provisions that uh, requ require proof of your fault. So sport generally, and particularly equine sport, has adopted this strict liability approach, which means that if there is a substance that's prohibited in there, then um, you, you will be liable as the, as the rider uh, for that, and you get the ban as if it was you. Of course, my position is that's that's a step too far. You might be able to just about argue that for a sprinter or a um, maybe a, um, a pole vaulter or something like that. But when when the ath the athlete that's got the contamination in the body is a different species to the athlete who ends up with the sanction, then I think that's a real problem. Um, in terms of all sports, horse or not, the justification for this strict liability was uh, found in the case of uh, USA shooting versus uh, and Quigley versus UIT, which you see on the slide there. And basically, the if I would summarize it, the view is that um, it doesn't matter if you catch some people who were simply making a mistake, um, because you will catch in the process people who were deliberate. Now, there's a problem with that, of course, in that um, if you uh, if you think that the main the usual maxim for law is that uh, it's better for ten guilty people to go free than for one innocent person to go to prison, and that's the way the criminal law works, then that's completely the opposite when we're looking at uh, doping control, which is entirely um, a, a civil matter. There's no question of the state prosecuting. It's it's the it's essentially a breach of contract that we're looking at, and the, the, the sanctions flow from that. So um, in human terms, you've got some really, really odd decisions from a natural justice point of view. For example, uh, Radican and Baxter both uh, sued, I did it myself there, sued by the um, IOC effectively for having uh, uh, prohibited substances in their bodies. Radican was a uh, a juvenile gym gymnast given something by her coach and Baxter had checked the ingredients of a, um, um, uh, of a medicine that they had that he had for a, for a condition he, that he was allowed to take but unfortunately he was in a jurisdiction where the, the ingredients were different to the ones at home and he ended up with a prohibited substance in his body despite his best efforts. Both of those got bans and both of those were rendered ineligible. And that's um, that's perfectly legal. Um, it doesn't sound very morally right, though. And um, there are those who say this shouldn't be the case with human sport. I say that there's a particularly stronger case with um, equine sport, given the reasons I've just discussed. You might say, when am I going to get on to cloning? Well, I do need to set these this. Um, groundwork this landscape as to what things are at the moment before we can even look at how cloning might impact. So um, what I'm, I'm making the point is that the current integrity regulations of horse racing and equestrianism are based on, um, to my mind, well they're based, particularly the FBI bases theirs on the World Anti-Doping Code which was developed for humans and the World Anti-Doping Code um, was written with the mindset that sometimes humans use something else to um, enhance what they do in a sport. So uh, clearly you're better off with skates rather than trainers if you are a skater. You will use a bobsleigh if you're a downhill bobsleigh. You'll uh, use a bow and arrow if you're uh, an archer. And that is, I'm afraid, how the, the uh, uh, regulations are written in terms of, uh, and with, that's the mindset in terms of horse sport. The horse is simply something that makes you able to jump higher, run faster and so on. But actually, if you look at it, and particularly from the point of view of someone who um, who, who who engages in the sport, it's much very different to that because the equipment I've just described is completely inert. Whereas, as we all know, that ride horses have their own agenda and sometimes they can um, um, prefer to go with that agenda instead of yours and, and it's often a, a series of intense negotiations to get a horse to to do to compete in a sport and go around any particular set of obstacles and so on.
So um, unfortunately, it, it, despite the lip service that the, the uh, regulations give to the idea of the horse as athlete, actually, if you read it in detail, the um, the horse is, is seen as a piece of equipment and if there's something wrong with that equipment there's nothing wrong with the human concerned suffering a sanction and i just think that is a, a an incorrect mindset and it leads to a lot of injustice so if i'm saying that um that we can socially construct a horse as athlete then i really need to try and justify that and i'm going to do that with a short picture show which um doesn't take very long and i, I think i can um, make my point with it so we had um horses as prey and as you can see ten thousand years ago perhaps a bit more um we were hunting them and there you have a cave painting which de depicts a horse being hunted by by arrows uh, about 4,500 years ago, we started to use them as a weapon of war and and unsurprisingly end up as a as a, um, a symbol in religion. And there you have the four horsemen of the apocalypse coming right into the center of of Western culture via religion and using the the um, military metaphor as well. And that continued. And the way the reason why that's important is because, of course, a lot of equestrian sports are based on the training that cavalry officers used to perfect their their riding so the three-day eventing and polo for example very much have military roots they were promoted as comrades by the propaganda machine during the first world war and you can you can see this in this rather sad painting where a horse is comforted as it dies by um his comrade the soldier despite the fact that there are shell bursts happening just nearby and his friend is saying you need to go but he won't because the horse is, is his comrade that's brought into sharper relief by some of the more romantic um depictions in literature like the war horse and so on and we've all seen or heard about the play uh, based on that um, in fact back in the time of, of jonathan swift um, horses were considered to be the closest relation to man um, because pre-Darwin Darwin, there was no thought of us being primates and here we have a picture of a little known part of Gulliver's travels where Gulliver ends up in a, on an island where the horses are the civilization and the men and the women are um, base and um, uncivilized savage creatures a metaphor for what, where he saw his society at the time so we've got that now got them creeping into art and literature as 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 almost as companions there as well as uh, when we ride them we've used them to celebrate our triumphs and his, uh, historical uh, epochs we've got the uh, the white horse there um in english countryside and the brandenburg gate with the horses above it in berlin um and we still do it. If you think about the recent, relatively recent construction of the Kelpies, these enormous 400 ton uh, sculptures of Clydesdale horses that are dominating the skyline as you go into Glasgow, celebrating the industrial past of the area. It's pretty much what you see, whether you go into Glasgow by road or by sea. Uh, expensive and um, very much evocative of what I'm trying to say. We, we are still we're still having horses in our culture and our celebrity and our celebrity status, as I will argue. In fact, um, they're, they're in our commerce as well, because if you think about the amount of time that horses spend uh, actually in front of us on adverts, um, but Budweiser is a very st strong example of that. We've all heard of the Budweiser uh, Clydesdales and there's some fantastic adverts that have been done with them and they, they maintain something like 250 for promotional purposes. But there's so much embedded in the American psyche that on two occasions they've been used in presidential inaugurations. Of course you can be famous for being famous and I guess the Clydesdale uh, Budweiser Clydesdale is that because um, it's not about the attributes so much of the um, horse that can transfer to the beer other than its recognized recognizable uh, nature but you can be famous being famous and Budweiser Clydesdales are a bit like Kim Kardashian I suppose I wouldn't want to compare poor old Kim to a uh, Clydesdale but um, that's really the limit of the comparison I suppose so where do we when certainly in, in the UK we can see um, the uh, icon of the horse in in many business logos and in literature um, you see 
um, the cultural influence turning up really from a very young age and we have horses in Disney cartoons and my goodness there's a lot of anthropomorphosis in that picture because if you saw a horse with that expression on its face you'd probably run in the other direction um, it's deliberately got a human face with expressions and it can talk in many instances in films and we start to anthropomorphize the horse from a very young age and uh, we can see this coming to a head in that um, it's not um, at all unusual over history and uh, over, over recent history to see the horse actually turning up on Vogue. And here we have black caviar on top of um, Australia Vogue uh, on the front of it. Now, I would argue that this plus plenty of soci sociological literature on social construction on horses all of that supports the idea that the horse, at least the elite competition horse, is actually an athlete celebrity. So when we are um, writing that an athlete needs to be regulated by a set of, of, of rules within a sport, then we're really talking about an athlete just like a human um, in that respect, but without human characteristics. So one of the problems we've got is that um, the FEI has a very complicated set of, of codes, three of them altogether. Uh, UK horse racing has its own rules, but they run very much on the same lines with strict liability. Um, there isn't a great separation between those disciplines, actually. But if you talk to the BHA, they'll say, well, anything that happens in the FEI, that's nothing to do with us. But the, the reality is, of course, that um, racehorses and equestrian uh, horses, equestrian sport horses, are often owned by the same very wealthy individuals and the same individuals are used as trainers and staff and the same vets travelled between different yards. And it's, it's actually more apparent than real that there's a separation between these disciplines and the integrity threats that they face. We know that within uh, anti-doping worldwide that the um, detection statistics are not great and that's pretty much true of horse sport as well. Given the complications that I illustrate on this slide, it's not surprising that basically we're catching what they call the dopey dopers, the people who aren't thinking too hard about what they're doing, haven't read the regulations, didn't check their emails, something's now on the banned list, or maybe they didn't check the feed. And sometimes they can't check the feed because even the queen, her horse has been tested positive for morphine and it was a contaminated feed bag and clearly she could do nothing about that. Um, we've had a number of reviews into horse racing and the BH and the um, Olympic sports uh, separately and I list some of these here uh, just so, so um, how many there have been just this century shows that there is a crisis even though many in the industry don't seem to acknowledge that there is um, but ultimately the BHA for example had to completely redesign its regulations because it wasn't in keeping with human rights um, the FEI has been through quite a lot of doping scandals since 2000 uh, and I list some of those there. So this is my point that, that it's not as if the current integrity regimes in the major players in horse sport are doing a particularly good job. Um, there's, a, there's a list there on my, on my slide of all the different uh, issues that happened in just two years uh, towards the end of my list before. Um, now this is recorded so you can have a look at that at your own at your own pace and i don't propose to go through all of those uh, bearing in mind we have uh, maybe only only a few minutes left um some of the um difficulties are that you can't distinguish between cheating and an accident with the current regimes um so one and that's my point about the regime as it is which is bringing us to the point in the presentation in the webinar we are now you can't currently distinguish between cheating and accident because of the clumsy nature of the regulations therefore you can't uh, deter the determined cheats because they know that the system is not particularly precise so if we say that is the position now how is it positioned to deal with genetically modified athletes well um, cloning humans hasn't happened yet. We've got a lot of indication from governments around the world that human, cloning humans is not ethically sound. 
Um, many organizations, health organizations and governments have come out against it. And there's, unless there's some rogue scientists somewhere, we don't have any cloned humans that we know of. However, um, we do have um, people who've written, like Mia, for example, about the possibility that cloned humans may not be that far away. Certainly ethical idea, ideas about ethics are moving. Um, and if we move on to the current position with equines, 2003, the first, world's first cloned horse, um, Merkur's gem was a clone of gem twist and is, is in a competition yard now, if not actually competing. Uh, neither the um, FEI, um, sorry, that's not quite right. The FEI doesn't prohibit competing using clones, but the BHA does. Um, the irony is basically then that if you allow clones, then um, you're allowing something that's been genetically created, engineered by science from hoof to ear tip. You're allowing that, but you wouldn't allow a natural animal, an animal that's come through the usual mating process to compete if it had a tiny trace of, say, for example, capsaicin or bute or even a poppy seed producing morphine finding. You wouldn't let that compute compete so my point is that the fei allows competing but with with, with clones the bha doesn't but given that there's a there is a factory uh being um, developed in china to produce cloned animals and the link to the newspaper article is at the bottom of that slide one of those groups of animals is racehorses and i i just struggle that without with 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 even just a fairly moderate level of fraud, I think that the those horses could end up in the racing circuit, even if they're prohibited. So if you are able to clone very successful racehorses en masse, then the economic incentive could be huge and many of the vagaries of the breeding process wouldn't matter anymore. So, you, for example, in Polo, where you've got whole teams that are clones in, in South America right now, then they are uh, showing the attributes of the donor animal throughout. You don't have to worry about the status of the mare, the status of the stallion. Um, it's a clone, it's a copy, it will do the same things. So what I'm saying then is that if we, if we problematize, which is a, a word in social science, which means look at the problems of, um, ethical issues, do, is it just another breeding practice? Uh, has a debate been had? I don't think it has, not properly. I think the BHA has banned it without thinking. I think the FBI has allowed it without thinking. The other thing is that gambling would be quite badly hit because if you knew that the thing was going to win because um, it, it's a clone of a horse that's always won, then who's going to give good odds on it? And the gambling industry could well be affected by that. Furthermore, and getting towards the end of my discussion now, we've got to think about the IP issues, because if, if you can um, give a, a intellectual property to a clone, then there's an even bigger problem, because um, if you keep the patent to the cloned animal, then you're going to dominate that sport, aren't you? So it's currently not possible to patent um, uh, pl uh, anything but plants. You can't patent an animal they tried it with dolly the sheep that being said they managed it with the onco mouse which was a rodent engineered for cancer research purposes the european patent regime did su suggest there was enough human intervention there for it to be patentable in australia the breast cancer gene uh, used for research was given a patent although that was overturned on appeal and Torrimans who's writing about this he said that uh, in fact the, the, the direction of travel the trajectory is towards the um, cloned animal being ethically and legally possible given the way that the, the case law is moving and if he's right that impacts on the likelihood of winning and also on the control of the bloodline and I certainly think he sh shows some very strong evidence for that being likely. So in summary, um, the FEI uses a, a version of the wider code in all three of its uh, integrity regulations. I don't think they're fit for purpose. They don't cope with current duty to cheating threats. I've written widely on why I don't think they, they work and I've summarized that today, I hope. The BHA has very similar challenges, although its, its regulations are much older, but the themes are the same. We are in the midst of an emergence of cloned equine athletes. I've, I think I've justified the word athlete today. 
um, and there hasn't been proper debate and we haven't really worked out what fair play means in a context of clones. There is an additional um, issue with cloning and IP, intellectual property, because if you can patent a clone, we're in a whole world of difficulty. So um, thank you for listening to that. 